All right, that's pulled up and I think the only thing visible, correct? Right. Okay, excellent. All right, so um, the last time I came before the club, we wanted to talk primarily about lithium batteries and the technology was kind of new and in its infancy to the point where there really wasn't much information out there. It was kind of a, a desert trying to find a lot of information. And I think that's why everybody was, was wanting to get that info. But this time around, um, a little bit different. There's was a lot of information. I've been through several courses on lithium and a lot of product lines have come through. And uh, I asked John to provide me with some questions uh, just so that we could kind of put the focus of the presentation in a direction. And I think I think I used his questions in a good way to kind of narrow this down to a very helpful presentation. So it's a lot of information. I'm going to try to go through it rather quickly. Um, if anybody has any questions, please, um, I'll have a time for that at the end. Uh, please write it down. Let me know what the question is. We can go back to the slide, go over it. Um, but just let me know at the end and we can do that. Or if you want to send me an email afterwards, uh, I can definitely answer those as well. So right here, it's going to be a demonstration on sealed lead acid versus lithium iron phosphate. Uh, going to start out first just by bullet pointing what I want to kind of cover. Uh, this is a nice picture of a battery line that we carry. We carry PowerSonic. Uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with that brand. It's a very well-known brand in the battery world, and they seem to be, in my opinion, one of the top brands for lithium. Um, and I'll go over that, why my opinion is, is in that direction. So uh, some of the things I'll go over first is just a brief overview. I'm not gonna go into a lot of details since I've already done this on SLA. I'm just gonna go over the basics just for those who might not have been at the last presentation and or might want a refresher course on the differences of those batteries. Then we're gonna primarily focus on the advantages of lithium, what makes, what makes them better than the alternative. Uh, how you want to charge these batteries. Uh, there's not many differences, but there are some to focus on. So uh, there's just some things that, you know, one of the things we wanted to touch was what, what do we not do with the batteries so that we can prolong the life and make the value of the battery actually worth it since these batteries can be expensive. I think one of the questions brought to me was why does a hundred amp hour battery cost a thousand dollars? This battery right here on the screen costs a thousand dollars. So I can go over and explain as to why this battery costs a thousand dollars versus the SLA version, which costs most people around two hundred dollars. Um, then we'll go over some of the technical advantages. There's some specific ones that many people can't really articulate. It's a it, it's something that a salesperson has a really hard time getting across to. You know, or even to understand themselves. So I just want to kind of focus on, there's a couple of those technical advantages that I feel are, are worth going over. And then, uh, like I said before, we'll go over some questions. So the types of SLA that I want to focus on today are uh, deep cycle, gel, general purpose, and high rate. Um, the batteries you probably are used to using are either deep cycle or general purpose. Um, some of you might have experimented a little bit with gel, um, and hopefully you found out that you need specific chargers for gel. You can't use the same charger with gel batteries that you can with deep cycle, general purpose, and high rate. And that's because the voltage threshold is lower on gel. So that's the only thing I really want to mention about gel. Um, the other versions of these batteries, I would say, would be better for our application if somebody uses their radio to transmit a lot, uh, they would probably, and they did it on a regular basis, they would probably want to get a deep cycle battery if they were off grid. Um, on grid, you would definitely want either a general purpose or a high rate because you're not going to be using the battery that often. It's going to be sitting in standby and it's not going to be a good application for a cycling battery, which is what deep cycle is. 
this is a picture I took at our store. Uh, if you look closely, you can see we are social distancing. So we got those little tape down right by the register. So just point that out to you. If anybody does want to come into the store to look at some batteries, um, we are practicing that currently and we are open. Um, this sign we keep in the store at the end of the counter. I find it's very helpful just to kind of go over those batteries so that the average user doesn't have to remember what each one does. They can kind of look at that sign briefly and figure out exactly which battery they need to use for their application. So something I wanted to point out, if this information isn't really uh, something you want to write down or memorize, you don't have to. You can come into the store, see it for yourself, and then make the notes that you want to make. Um, but there is a certain battery that's good for each application. So it is good to know the differences between these if you want to stay with SLA due to it being a lower price point. This is kind of a blown up version of that sign that I had a nice slide of that I wanted to just kind of show you uh, so that if anybody wanted to kind of see what was on that sign a little bit better, they could. And I'll leave that up here for you know a few seconds if anybody has anything they want to look at in regards to these. One of the things I'll point out is you can see that the gel has the lower voltage range right here compared to all the other batteries having the same one. That's why you need to be careful and use a specific charger. Um, even though they have the longest life, they will have a very short life if you don't use the correct charger. All right. Okay, on to lithium, which is the topic I'm most excited to talk about because this is, I think, what most people want to actually uh, see here. So I blew up a picture um, from one of my helpful, um, I guess it would be my handout sheets for this product line that kind of goes over some of the big features of the battery. I'm gonna kind of go over them in my own way, but this is how the manufacturer wants to show you why you should buy their battery. It's kind of how they, they throw it all out there. So they want you to know it's 40% of the weight compared to lead acid batteries, up to 10 times more cycles than lead acid batteries, faster charging, low self discharge, delivers twice the power, even high discharge rate while maintaining high energy capacity. So they're just telling you this thing's the best thing you've ever bought. There's no downsides to it, buy it. Um, and then you see the price and you're like, wait a second, why should I spend this much money? So that's what I'm gonna go over here quickly. Um, so just right here, I'm not gonna really go into detail on um, some of these, uh, but I will go into detail on safety, cycle life, uh, but temperature, I think that pretty much explains yeah, itself. It can operate at colder temperatures. And it can also operate at really extreme temperatures. We're not going to really get much hotter than 167 degrees, but we can definitely end up in situations where we're getting down to the negatives in temperature. So, you know, I, I think one of the questions that was brought to me was a lot of people like to um, go to high altitudes and transmit. So that's why I wanted to include that information. Um, so that's something to consider. Uh, it has the same footprint with more power. So that's another thing is I'm going to go over why that actually is, why if you have a hundred amp hour SLA battery and you have a hundred amp hour lithium battery, you actually have more capacity in the lithium battery, even though they have the same rating. So it's a little complicated, but I have a chart and I'm hopefully I can kind of communicate that because it's it was very confusing to me. So uh, we'll we'll get to that here shortly. Um, there's some differences in charging. So lithium batteries they charge 60% faster than your average SLA battery, which means if you're stuck, the battery's drained, you're able to get up and operating a lot quicker, which is important. Uh, especially when you're not realizing that your battery is dead and you're trying to transmit, which is not likely to happen with lithium. And we'll go over that too. So the weight 
is about 60% lighter, which can be really huge if you're the only person moving this equipment and you need it to operate for a lot of hours and you end up dealing with a battery that weighs over 50 pounds um, can be pretty hard to maneuver in some situations. So the, the light weight of the lithium tends to be one of the main features that people immediately see as the best benefit, but it's really just, you know, the battery's lighter. It's not really a huge benefit. There's a lot of other things that are way better than the weight, but it's worth noting. Um, something I like to point out, it's eco-friendly. Uh, you can recycle it. They're non-toxic and zero emissions. Lead, on the other hand, is toxic. I have to warn people, especially new associates, uh, I don't know what it is about lead car battery terminals, but people like to touch it and they like to massage it because I guess it's smooth and I have to tell people, no, that's lead and it's on your hands and it gets, it, it's not good. There's a, <laughs> lead is toxic and long exposure to it can be bad. So I always wear gloves whenever I touch anything that's got lead attached to it just out of safety. Um, that's primarily because I'm overexposed to it on a daily basis. Uh, one thing I do want to note here is, uh, the warranty through Powersonic is two years. I went through and I checked several other manufacturers and a lot of manufacturers have a 10 year warranty. Um, if you dig deep into the 10 year warranty, you end up finding out that if you submit your warranty claim and they decide that you did something to the battery that caused the issue, they can charge you hourly for their testing. Um, and you have to agree to that before you ship it to them. And one of the manufacturers I looked at, it's upwards to $160 an hour for that charge. So Definitely the devil's in the details when it comes to warranties, especially with batteries. Um, the lower the warranty tends to be the better in regards to you getting the actual warranty because in two years, if this battery fails, chances are it's something to do with the manufacturing. And that's really what the warranty is for. It's not for user error where we do something to the battery and then all of a sudden something we did caused it not to work. Um, that's usually most of the warranties we end up seeing that ends up being the case. So I, you know, patiently remind people the proper ways to treat batteries often. Um, I think most of the people in this club have been through that once or twice and probably know for the most part how to treat SLA batteries, but maybe not yet lithium. So we'll go over that. So one of the things about safety I wanna talk about is these batteries, they don't leak. Um, that's pretty big, especially if we're worried about corrosion and um, basically our equipment getting damaged as a result of the battery. You don't have to worry about that with lithium. Um, most lithium is also protected by monitoring systems, which is a great feature. Uh, you can monitor a lot of things on applications on your phone. If you're within a certain amount of feet from the battery, you can view a lot of information on the battery. So the guessing game of how well is my battery is out the window if you do it, if you do it right. Um, and I'll kind of go over that uh, whole system at the end. That's part of the technological advantages that I believe this battery has over the SLA. So we'll go over that in, in a little bit more detail, not much, but just a little bit. Uh, the dry cell construction, uh, no acid, uh, can be mounted in any direction. So you no longer have to worry about, is there going to be acid spilling out of this eventually? Should I not mount it this way? Is this the proper way? You don't have to worry about any of that. Uh, one of the best features of this battery, now this, this, this right here will answer, why do I use lithium over SLA? Primarily, if we look at this chart right here, we can see that the capacity rating on the battery. So at batteries plus bulbs, 
when we test batteries for warranty, our threshold for when a battery is no longer has useful life is 80% of its capacity. So when you buy a, a rechargeable battery brand new, we can test it and expect about 100% of its capacity. If you were to come in within the warranty period to get a warranty, let's say if you don't believe the battery's holding a charge, our threshold on that warranty would be 80%. So if the battery was performing at 85% of its charge, you wouldn't get a warranty. Um, if it was performing at 80 or 79%, we would give you a warranty. So that's kind of across the board in the battery industry. So that's something I like to point out because it's common knowledge to me, but everybody else would assume that a battery, you know, should perform at 100%. And if it's not, then I should get my warranty. Or maybe some people have another idea of it should, you know, maybe if, when it gets down to zero, who knows. But I know that when I got in the industry, that was a mystery to me. So when we look at cost of ownership, we're looking at useful life. It's not useful to use a battery and have to charge it constantly. We can get usage out of it, but it's inconvenient. So that's what this chart goes over. They're saying that in roughly 2000 plus, they're willing to say 2200, which is conservative because uh, most manufacturers will oversell their battery and say it's going to last 3000 to 5000 cycles, but they're not considering useful life. They're considering how long is this battery going to last until it's no longer charging or operating, which I don't think is fair. So I like to point that out. Most SLA batteries will give you about 200 cycles. So if you figure you're getting four to five times the use out of this battery, then you are getting your money's worth out of the battery. The cost of operation is a lot lower than what it seems to be. So we'll... So if the average SLA lasts two years in cyclic applications compared to eight years with lithium, that kind of paints a better picture for us here. That maybe what we're buying is not something that is a more expensive option, but it's something that's a more convenient option and it's actually providing us with better power over a longer period of time. So um, to... Okay, I, I had an example where I put this in a math equation, but I think I removed it because I, it seemed a little convoluted. But uh, basically, if we want to spell out the cost of ownership for this battery, it ends up being about, I compared a nine amp hour battery is what was my example. And the nine amp hour battery from PowerSonic costs $100. Um, the nine amp hour battery, that's an SLA, from me costs around $41 and change. If we factor in the useful life two years versus eight years, the nine amp hour costs around $22, 21. And the other battery costs around, I think it was between 10 and $15. So it costs less overall is the gist of it. Um, and that's pretty much something I saw across the board. So charging lithium. With lithium batteries, uh, you can definitely charge them a lot quicker. And it's up to you, really. You don't have to charge them four times faster. It's up to you and it's up to your charger. Uh, most chargers will have a setting. New chargers will have a setting for lithium batteries. If yours doesn't, um, I think I go over this in a further slide, but you definitely want to reach out to the manufacturer to see if your charger is safe to use on the lithium battery. In most cases it is, you just have to avoid things like pulse charging um, and float charging, which most chargers have float charging. So that's where it becomes uh, something you should reach out to the manufacturer about, in my opinion. So it does recover quickly too. So you can charge, being able to charge it fast is a big feature 
SLA batteries, if you charge them fast, they won't hold their full capacity. Um, they'll li they like to switch over from a fast charge to a very slow charge at the last 15%. And that can take a long time depending upon the charger. So very important thing to note in regards to lithium and emergency situations is that. Um, when you put it in storage, you can uh, you need to apply some charge to the battery. So about 40 to 50%. But the good thing about this is how it does store. So I kind of wanted to focus a little bit on that. Um, so in long-term storage, because these batteries cannot be on a float charge, they should not be stored at 100% state of charge, which means you should never leave these on a trickle charger. If you have one, you don't leave it on a charger. You basically fully charge it or you get it to about, you know, the 40 to 60% if you don't want to fully charge it and you let it sit and it'll be at that level when you go to use it. Uh, if it's going to sit for more than a year, you'll want to look at an alternative to just letting it sit. You'll probably want to charge it. But that's something you cannot do with an SLA battery. If you let an SLA battery sit for that long without a charger, it will sulfate and it will ruin the plates. And it will often corrode too on the terminals. So it's, it's not good to do that with any battery. Um, but lithium, which is one of the great features of lithium, you just can't leave it uh, dead apparently at a, a full discharge is what the manufacturer is telling me. So um, the other thing is with the lithium battery, uh, if you were to let it sit, it will deliver that full capacity, which is huge in, in our situation where we might not want to leave a battery always charging or have it always charging. We might want to just fully charge it and then maybe monitor it every so often with that app to see how charged it is. That would be way more convenient and more assuring than having a battery that we just know, hey, this is about a year old. Um, it gave me good life the last time I used it. So hopefully the next time I go use it, it gives me that same life and I don't have anything mysterious happen with it. Um, just it's way more reliable in my opinion. For those of us who like to see the data and like to know what's happening with our battery, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a way better solution. Um, so this is where I went over that. So most current charging systems work with lithium technologies and many are smart chargers that have auto sense or have a selector for lead acid versus lithium. But if your charging system's more than five years old, it would be smart to contact an applications engineering department for the manufacturer to ensure that the charger is compatible. And uh, one thing worth noting is PowerSonic does have an engineering department which deals with people and their applications and they're happy to go over that with you. Um, so if you need that information, please let me know and I'll be happy to assist. Uh, this is something that I wasn't aware of until I saw my presentation from PowerSonic about batteries is that lithium actually has a high voltage um, well, actually, it's a low voltage discharge. So as the battery's capacity is being drained, so as its state of charge is going down, its voltage stays pretty constant. It's almost as constant as it was when it was charged. Um, the best way to explain this, I find, is with a flashlight example. Because when I saw this, it made no sense to me being in the battery world because that's a lot of times how I detect how charged a battery is. Somebody will come in and I don't have an instant way of checking capacity. So I look at the voltage and the voltage will tell me roughly how charged the battery is. I can then ask the customer a few questions as to what's going on. And like a doctor, diagnose the situation right on the spot. So finding out that voltage in lithium doesn't matter was kind of like a, a shocker to me because I'm, what do you mean it doesn't matter? The voltage is always going to be the same. Didn't make much sense. But then when someone gave me the flashlight example, it started making a little more sense. So I'll go over that here 
with us. So basically, and I'll go back to that slide too, so we could look at that after this. Um, I'm not sure if I put it on the next one, but basically if we were operating a flashlight off an SLA battery, as soon as the capacity was being drained, and we've probably seen this with our flashlights with even alkaline batteries, as it's getting low, the light gets dimmer. So we kind of have an idea that, oh, all right, the battery is about to die. So that's a result of that voltage dropping. Now, if we were using a lithium battery in that flashlight, that light would stay as bright from the beginning of its life to the end. And eventually it'll just cut off. And that would indicate that it was dead. You go to try to turn it on again and it wouldn't turn on. Oh, my battery's dead. No warning. But we got more voltage out of it for the whole operation. So if we're looking at it in that regard, we got better performance out of the battery. More technically more capacity because voltage and amperage equals wattage. So we're getting more out of it. So, um, well, I promised I'd go back to that chart. So that's where you can see the voltage on the lithium, which is the orange line remaining fairly constant throughout the discharge. You know, we're at 40% discharge. It's still close to that 13 threshold. And it only gets down to the SLA when we get close to zero. So that that to me was a pretty significant improvement in battery technology. Um, so moving on from there, uh, one of the most noticeable differences other than that is that lithium is basically independent of its discharge rate. So the best way to kind of explain that is looking at this chart and seeing where everything converges right here. So, and this is sort of, I guess it would be something worth relating to in our application, primarily because if I look at my questions here, one of the first questions was um, the best battery options for operating a radio at low power, less than one amp during receive, but at high power during transmit. So if we look at this, the only type of battery that would be good during receiving would be the other technologies because at the chart, when we're at a low discharge, their capacity is actually at about 100%. But once we start amping up that discharge and we start pulling more amperage out of the battery, their capacity actually drops. So if we were to rate that battery and discharge it at 0.4, on a tester, it would test out at 80% capacity. Um, in a testing world, when I test a battery for a warranty, I have to, one of the things I have to input is its discharge rate. Um, and the reason for that is because of this chart. So we have all these testing guidelines and I never understood why we had to test the batteries at 0.1C because as you can imagine, 0.1C, which is a, like 10% a of the battery's capacity. So if we got a 100 amp hour battery, we're putting 10 amps into the battery to charge it and to discharge it, that takes a really long time. Um, and we have to warranty a battery. It can take three, three four days to test a, a high amp hour battery. And that's a long time for people to wait. So some people would cut corners and increase that discharge rate. And as a result, you don't have correct capacity ratings on the battery. You can't see where the battery's actually at because you might, it might test out, let's say the battery's at 80% of its life, you put it at 0.2C and it's already missing 20%. Now it's going to test at 60%. So we get an inaccurate reading of where the battery's actually at, where if we tested it at 0.1, it would say it was at 80% because 20% of its overall life is missing. So if that's confusing, I totally understand because it is 
very confusing to me as well until I really look at this chart. And then once you look at the chart, really what they're trying to tell you is that no matter what the discharge is, the battery's capacity is always going to be, if it's a hundred amp hour battery, it's always going to have a hundred amp hours to discharge off of. So if we're pulling 80 amps out of the battery, we're not going to get 60% of that capacity. We'll get a hundred percent of that capacity, which if we were calculating runtime, that would come into play. So, in cyclic applications where the discharge rate is greater than 0.1C, we're not constantly having the battery in standby, a lower rated lithium battery will have a higher actual capacity than a comparable lead acid battery. So what that means is if we're using a 10 amp hour lithium battery and a 10 amp hour lead acid battery, and we're cycling it, we're getting a lot more usage out of the lithium battery than we are out of the lead acid battery. But if it's in standby, we, we're not. That's the gist of it, is basically it's, it's, a, it's got some usage in standby, but this is not one of them. Uh, most of the batteries have that built-in battery management system. In PowerSonic, they have it incorporated through an application that you can download on your phone. Um, they call it the PowerSonic Bluetooth app. You can view the status of the battery. I have a, a small picture on, an, on my next slide, I believe, so we can kind of get an idea of what it sort of looks like. Um, it's a very convenient way to see what's going on with the battery, which honestly is exciting for me because I'm a battery nerd. And if I can see what's going on with the battery instantly, that to me is, is a miracle. Um, just being in this industry since 2007, it's been a dream to me to be able to understand what's going on with the runtime battery instantly. Uh, every technology that has been presented to me, I've been sold testers that can test capacity and none of them are accurate. Uh, not a single one. They cost a lot of money. So you're investing hundreds upon hundreds of dollars in a device that you're hoping can tell you how many amp hours is left instantly on a battery. And I haven't found a single one to be reliable. Um, the information's all over the place and there's just no way you can right on the spot tell exactly what's going on with your battery if you're wanting to check runtime. If you want to check power, as in cold cranking amps, like if you were going to bring your car battery to Batteries Plus or one of my competitors, they would put a device on your battery and check its cranking amps. That is very accurate. For whatever reason, they cannot figure out how to test capacity instantly. And for technology that's been on the market for this long, it's shocking to me. So I like to point that out because with lithium, everything is managed through its own internal system. So you can actually accurately get those readings. You can see how many cycles have you went through? What's the capacity left on the battery? Because it's testing resistance and other things that are related internally in that system. Um, the other cool thing I wanted to point out is we might want to have several batteries in our setup and we might want to manage it all on this application and we might want to know what each battery is. Well, they come with serial numbers that you can rename. So if you want to call it radio one, station two, whatever the name may be, you can rename it on the application. Um, so I, I found that to be pretty, uh, useful information. So I wanted to share that. Um, being able to view the state of charge, the voltage, the capacity, and the battery health, um, like I pointed out earlier, is huge. Um, I'm sure we've all been in that situation where we wondered why we couldn't see this information in 2021 already. Um, like why can't I just see that on my battery? That should be something that I can see. Now you can if you invest in the PowerSonic batteries. So I, I thought that was uh, pretty neat. Um, 
the another thing is that it, it'll monitor events. So if you have an issue with your equipment or anything happens, you'll know what happened based on, you know, how it monitored the event, whether it was a voltage spike or anything that might have came through your power line. So this is like a brief look of what the application looks like when you're monitoring uh, battery load, temperature, and life cycles, which that can be very interesting information if you're wanting to know what's my load on my system, uh, what voltage am I currently at. Very helpful if we're trying to run diagnostics on a setup. So basically the summary of lithium is it means that a little bit more money up front provides a large list of benefits. Some of the ones I wanted to highlight were four to five times the useful service life, lighter weight, faster charging, and the circuit protection that's built in um, is pretty huge too. Uh, that is done through that battery management system. So um, I know I went through that a little quick and I tried to not put too much information on the screen. I do have a lot more information available that um, can kind of go into detail about some of the things I went through. So if there's anything I talked about that might have interested you and you might want to know more information about it, please let me know if I can't answer it right now, I will definitely get back to you and let you know uh, the answer to your question. So I will open the floor to anybody who wants to ask me any questions. If, uh, if people would like, uh, just uh, go into the participants and uh, hit the little uh, hand, uh, hold up the hand button and we'll, we'll take people in order there. I know that uh, from the chat window, we have a question of everybody wants to know what your microphone is. They're loving your audio. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, well, I guess as you can see, I'm trying to find out where I can look at the question pane. <laughs> So uh, yeah, that's in the that's in the chat window. Chat? Well, they they will be okay. Uh, we, right now, we've got somebody that's asking there, but that was uh, that that was some of the stuff. Sure. In the chat window was they want to know what kind of microphone you're using. <laughs> okay, um, I actually use a. Let me uh, let me see real quick. So I got a. Hold on been a while since I've had to look this information up so I don't know if it's going to be in my sound settings all right it's a it's a it's a basically a um, microphone that's set up for high quality audio it's a headset um, so it has surround sound and it's it's designed for um, broadcasting so I uh, it but it's I think it cost me uh, about a hundred fifty dollars it wasn't um, it was mostly mostly for the audio on the headphones, but the microphone was a added benefit. Um, I'll, I'll let you know. I, I don't know the exact model. I know it's made by Steel Series, um, but it's one of their uh, it's it's top of the line Steel Series. Uh, okay. Well, let's uh, let's go on. We have a, a question from uh, uh, Jim K four CGY. Uh, go ahead, Jim. Yeah, the question is. What is considered a charging cycle? Um, I've heard so many different definitions of it that uh, anytime, even if it's only for 10 minutes, uh, and the reason I ask is I'm running uh, a pair of six volt, 150 ampere hour AGM battery solar charge. So every day they get at least one cycle, but probably go up and down a number of times with the uh, variation of sunlight. So what is a cycle considered? So essentially a cycle is whenever you're draining the battery beyond its float depth. So for most batteries, that's 85%. Once you hook up the battery to a charger and it gets to about 85%, it's gonna switch to a float charge from a bulk charge. Um, Primarily at that point, um, 
or so so essentially the i guess the best way to answer this is with batteries whenever you drain them close to 50 percent that's about as low as you want to go because if you go to a full discharge on a battery that can negatively affect it so i would say anywhere between 50 percent to 85 percent would be considered a cycle and that's primarily because you're draining the charge enough to affect the plates the materials that are set up on the plates to right. to have that reaction go on and create that tension inside the battery that gives us the voltage that we need if you don't go that low it's not that hard on the battery so that's that's the best way to explain it is like if you consider the fact that when you get below 50 percent you're harming the battery the closer you get to 50 percent the closer that's considered to be a full cycle so if you go halfway you might be going through a half cycle because you're halfway draining the battery beyond what they consider to be a full discharge, which is which is fifty percent. Okay, so taking it down to uh, using ten percent of it, they take it down to ninety percent, and then back up to a hundred and back and forth. It takes wouldn't it be a full time. cycle. It take a number of times before you get to a cycle. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Yep. Okay, we've got a question uh, from uh, Warren Can for LYF. Hey, thanks so much for a really nice presentation. Uh, what the question I have is regarding to the fire hazard of uh, lithium uh, iron phosphate batteries as opposed to uh, SLA batteries. So um, one of the key features of lithium is the casing. They build them in flame retardant casings so that they don't have to worry about that. All right, thank you. Yeah, these, yeah. These, are, these are not the lithium polymers that they use in drugs. Yes. They're, they're yeah. bursting the flame with alarming uh, frequency. I got a lot of questions about that when that was happening. A lot of people were worried about Samsung. Yeah. We have a, uh, a comment here from uh, uh, Dave uh, can for uek uh, he, know, he notes that his uh, FT818D's output power drops when the voltage goes below 12 volts. And he has uh, uh, some lithium iron phosphate uh, batteries. And the, the, he says it makes it easy to stay at full output, which is, I, I think, a point you made. And then, yeah. uh, and then uh, Steve uh, can for tkr uh, talks about the fact that the, these batteries have been sort of a real game changer in the uh, sailing community. I could definitely see that. I, one, of the, one of the things that um, happened on my honeymoon in 2010 was I, I went to Hawaii and uh, we were about to go sport fishing and there was a gentleman working on his sailboat and I saw that he had a bunch of uh, Lifeline 8D batteries in there and uh, if anybody knows anything about Lifeline, those are expensive batteries. And I, I said to him, I was like, wow, you got a lot of money in that sailboat. And he's like, he's like, you'd be surprised to know how long these, these batteries have lasted me. And uh, he said they lasted him 10 years. Personally, if I was out on a sailboat, I would probably swap them out sooner than that. <laughs> But I, I found that was pretty interesting. He's like, all he's like, I maintain them all the time, and you know, take good care of them. Yeah. And uh, I thought that was interesting. So I could imagine that um, being being that you're out on the open water, having something more reliable is is a game changer. Yeah, what are the, uh, the the uh, and the weight. This is a little bit off off what we've been discussing here, but uh, one of the uh, people had asked about. Uh, What batteries can be recycled? He's been basically all of his batteries have been going in a box, and he's not sure where to take them. And I know that uh, that Batteries Plus does recycling, uh, certainly of of some of the lead acid batteries. Can you uh, give us a rundown on just sort of what's recyclable and what isn't? Yes. Um, so with these batteries, as you can imagine, we haven't really seen any of them, if, if maybe just a few to get recycled. Um, 
and uh, we dispose of them the same way we dispose of rechargeable lithium. Um, so it's 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 something that they don't consider to be uh, a charge. So they don't they don't charge for it currently. That can change um, with recycling. It's especially with new products. It's li it's a living and breathing organism that every so often they'll find something that they didn't consider, whether it be a fire hazard in the shipping or something in the process that creates an issue, and then they have to charge a fee. Or um, so I, I always throw that in there as you know, if you have something to recycle, you don't want to pay a fee. You want to know for sure what everything is. You can reach out to me before you head to the store, and I'll be happy to personally assist you and make sure that the information is accurate. We've got a, uh, a question from Mike McPherson about uh, the, the, uh, the, the radio noise aspects of it. Uh, Mike, do you just want to uh, unmute and just ask the question there, or I can, I can read your question off the chat? Sure, I can jump in. So uh, <clears throat> one of the things, of course, that, that we're concerned about uh, is RF noise uh, that's going to interfere with our ability to copy weak signals, and um, uh, you all you all uh, handle PowerSonic. One of the other big competitors and one of the first in the market was BioNO, and uh, uh, BioNO claims that uh, their batteries, and of course the battery doesn't make any RF noise. It's the battery management circuitry. Um, uh, BioNO claims that theirs are completely RF quiet. Uh, does PowerSonic say anything about theirs? So I just have one question um, with in regards to the other manufacturer, their claim, you said that their battery management system isn't quiet. So even though their claim is that it is quiet, you've used it and you know that it isn't quiet. No, no, I have no personal experience, although I suspect there are other people uh, on this Zoom who do. Uh, OK, but BioNO claims that theirs are, are completely quiet. What I can say is that in all of the research that I did and in all of the training modules that I've been through, I haven't seen anything to indicate that that's something to point out to customers or something to be concerned with um, is interruption in radio frequencies um, or anything like that. So I, it's nothing that has ever come up. It's something that we can definitely reach out that would be a good question um, in regards to when I went over about the charger and whether or not the charger would be compatible for your uh, battery. That would be another good question for those application specialists at the manufacturer. They, you would reach out to them, give them your application and say, this is the battery I'm looking to buy. It has a Bluetooth battery management system. Will that Bluetooth capability interfere with my specific application they might even ask you for the serial number or model number of your radio so that they can either do the test themselves or i mean some manufacturers will go that far to help out their customers other manufacturers you'll end up holding the bag so um i find powersonic to be one of the manufacturers that's helpful so I'd be encouraged to reach out to them about that if that's something that we want to know. So if, if that is very important, um, if someone can remind me at the end, if we want to find an answer on that, and I, I can try to reach out to them myself and provide the group with an answer for that. Okay. And, and uh, it's, it's not the Bluetooth that is likely to be the problem. It's the battery management circuitry. You've probably got the, you know, switching high-speed switches uh, in their uh, converting voltages, and that's what causes the I gotcha. crash that you hear. Okay. Kind of similar to a... Um, it's um, like wall warts and, and, you know, power bricks and that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, like, like the sine... Like sine wave, um, like... Um, I'm, I, I'm drawing a blank on the device, but like uh, inverters. Yeah. 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 Yeah, inverters, uh, uh, fluorescent lights, that sort of thing. Yeah. We do have a couple of, uh, uh, I'm not seeing any additional questions. Uh, we do have a couple of club members that actually have been uh, using the uh, lithium iron phosphate battery. 
do any of them just have any observations that they might have relative to noise and other other things? I have a question. In our typical inexpensive ham radio walkie-talkies made in China, as well as our typical laptops, they're lithium batteries, but are they lithium polymer or the newer lithium? No, so the those batteries that we've been using are a different chemistry. So those are not lithium iron phosphate. They're uh, lithium ion or lithium polymer, okay. which, is, which is a total different chemistry. My question will be quick. With lithium ion, a rule of thumb I've always heard is it's a good idea to let, you know, maybe charge the batteries anywhere when they get down to 30 to 60%. Is does that agree with what you've been taught? You saying with lithium ion or yes, like my yeah. laptop or cell phone? Yes, yeah. With that technology, um, you don't want to let it sit at a low charge because what will happen is if it sits at a low charge and you let's say you drain it to about ten percent and you let your laptop sit for two weeks, at the as the battery ages it's going to discharge more. And when it's that low, it has its own system. That's not really that smart inside of it. That will cause the battery to what they call go to sleep and it will put out zero volts. So it's important that you don't let it sit at a low voltage because what it'll do is it'll essentially brick a good battery. So you so get a brand saying Definitely charge it when it gets yes. down to 25%. Yeah, before you put it in any type of storage, you want to charge it to full. And okay. that type of battery, you can leave on a float charge versus lithium iron phosphate, which they say don't leave always on a charger. Okay. So there's no harm in leaving it on a float charger. No, right? no, because most most devices that have these batteries, the, the um, computer batteries and the cell phone batteries, they're smart enough now to stop charging when they need to stop charging. Gotcha. All right, well, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay, I, I think we've uh, exhausted the uh, the questions there. So let me, uh, round of applause. Thank you very much. Uh, lots of folks are muted out there. So you <laughs> hearing the applause, but, but, but it is out there. Yeah, uh, no problem. Here, here.